Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It's Thursday, April 18th. Derek Van Riper, Eno Saris here with you on this episode. We have some key news and notes to get to, but more importantly, we have a story that Eno wrote looking at players whose hit tool might be ahead of their power, trying to find power that will show up this season, or at least in the somewhat near future. We're going to dig into a few players that were recently promoted in this week's edition of Project Prospect, and we'll take a look at a few intriguing names as part of our weekly waiver preview. So a lot of ground to cover before Eno heads to Las Vegas, which has to be really exciting, right? I mean, how, how pumped going to the sphere. It's going to be fun. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm doing something that I probably shouldn't do at my age, which is attempting to go to two shows in one night. So we'll see. (laughs) We see how that goes. There's a, yeah, there's another, I'm going to see Fish at the Sphere, and then a band called Eggy uh, that I was that someone told me I should see is starting at 11:30 after the Fish show. So hey, sounds like a Vegas night. The 11:30 second show is going to be absolutely <laughs> incredible. Uh, blow by blow reports as I get them will be shared with our Discord community. So <laughs> oh, be no. sure to jump in the Discord. I'll just put the occasional you know did this if you can give me updates. <laughs> so you can tell me if you want to tell me what's going on, and I'll pass it on. You know, as as is deemed appropriate. Let's get to some news and notes though. Let's start off with Tanner Houck, uh, and I think this is a general question based on the state of pitching right now because of the early season pitching injuries that are piling up again. What I think happens is guys that start performing really well, especially over a full month to begin the season, their value takes off. You're working on some new starting pitcher rankings right now and guys that are cruising like Tanner Houck is right now, I think are really tough to rank appropriately. And it makes me wonder, are you better off buying high on surging pitchers like Houck than you are on trying to trade for the still healthy aces. Because I think the value of pitching just goes up after the season begins. It's like the opposite effect of buying a car. You buy a car, you drive it up the lot, it loses some value right away. Brand new, used, whatever. It goes down as soon as you drive it off the lot. Pitching, I feel like, ticks up in value as long as your pitchers are healthy as soon as the season begins and you get a few good starts strung together. It's really... Uh, yeah, it's really amazing. I was thinking about uh, I, I've left the health grades on there, mm-hmm. you know, the preseason health grades, and I had no other option because of attrition, because he's healthy, because he's pitching so well. I felt like I had to put Tyler Glass now still in the top five. You know, I mean, that's it seems right. But he still has that F health grade from before the season and it, the hammer could come at any time. Uh, and so, you know, I found, uh, Chris sale had an F grade and and moved up. Um, you know, you had some, uh, some D grades moving up, uh, uh, Garrett crochet, like, you know, pitching so well, how many innings does he have? Where do you put him? Uh, (laughs) I moved him into the top 30 just based on he's healthy now and he's pitching really well. So, yeah, I mean, the more established guys are the harder ones. Like, you know, you probably can't get Freddie Peralta from somebody right now. Um, But the, 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 the fact of the matter is he's, you know, had trouble staying healthy in the past. And we don't know that just because he started the season healthy. Uh, he's any more likely to finish the season with a full slate of innings. So, yeah, I, I, I do wonder that. Uh, I do have Hauk in my top 50 right now. Uh, it could be uh, he could move up. Um, you know, I, I, I he's like around some some really like serviceable vets right now. Luis Severino, um, you know, uh, Merrill Kelly. Uh, you know, should he move up into the hype hype with Jared Jones? Maybe, maybe he'll be in the, the back end of the top 40 with Jared Jones and, and my man, Edward Cabrera. Um, so, you know, but do those guys move ahead of, you know, a Joe Musgrove who is healthy um, and his secondaries are great, but his, his primary is not. So that's where uh, and, the, and you know, you, you, you take it in tandem with the strikeouts minus walks because, you know, strikeouts minus walks is becoming more and more powerful with every start. Um, and so, you know, stuff plus in tandem with that is the, the, the best way, I think, to kind of look at somebody. How 
is doing it all. He has a 25% strikeout minus walk rate. Average is 12. Uh, he has a 109 stuff plus a 104 location plus. Everything looks good. And um, I have a feeling he'll move up a little bit more as I put the final tweaks on my rankings today. Yeah, you look at what he's doing differently. I mean, a few more sliders this year, more splitters, uh, kind of moving away from the cutter a little bit. Still throws it once in a while, but that was a 10.8% usage last year. It's under 6% in the early going. So tweaks, but not like a complete overhaul, at least in terms of the mix. I think that bodes well. I think the other thing with Hauk, he's been very good against righties for a long time. I think he falls into that bucket of, if he were to figure out lefties or a way to get lefties out more consistently, that would unlock everything. Do you think they've found a plan that works better for him? Because if he's done that, that's the thing that would give me that extra nudge to say, maybe he's a top 30 or a top 40 starter given the state of pitching right now. Yeah. I mean, the, the cutter was touted and it does have a uh, better movement uh, than it did at the beginning of, of last season. Uh, more cut, more horizontal cut. Um, and, you know, I, I do think it's a better pitch now than it was before. But in terms of how often he's using it against lefties, uh, you know, it's up to 7%. He's still sinker slider against lefties. So it's more, I think, about where he's putting it and what his strategy is um, with the... Uh, with the two seamer, um, you know, for example, uh, his vertical pitch location, two lefties on the sinker, um, you know, is higher than it was last year, much higher. Uh, on average, it's six inches higher. Now that's an average. So you're averaging out the whole entire heat map. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, but still it's the highest it's ever been. And so I think he's kind of, instead of saying, hey, let me throw, you know, pitches I'm not as comfortable with um, against lefties because they're new. He's saying, well, why don't I use the pitches I am comfortable with, but in slightly new manners? Um, and, um, you know, he's going to run into some teams with some really tough lefties that will, you know, sort of regress his stats for him. <laughs> mm. um, it's still a release point that lefties like because they can see the ball for a long time and in a sinker and slider it's pitches that lefties love from a righty so it, at his core he still has some of the flaws and that's why uh, you know i'm not moving him into the top 25 or anything um but he dominates righties it's one of the reasons i liked him ahead of the season he dominates righties and if you're going to dominate righties and you know, get by on lefties, you're going to be part of a, a large group of pitchers that has success year in and year out. Would you buy the idea that Tanner Houck should be similarly valued to Michael King at this point? I think so. I mean, Michael King's, uh, you know, value it, it has lessened with his, 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 um, his velo dropping. Uh, and he is just that kind of pitcher where he dominates righties with a sinker and slider, and then he gets by against uh, lefties when it comes to uh, uh, you know using his four seam and change. Maybe his four seam is a little better, um, and his projections, uh, his park is is a better situation. Uh, but um, you know, probably I have the distance between them too far, so I'm gonna. While we are on the radio, I'm going to move Tanner Houck up. I'm going to move him even with the hype crew. Oh, I really need to get that cliffhangers music and just hit that button when you're making <laughs> I can't do the yodel. I won't even try. It would be the most embarrassing moment for me on the show in a long time. Well, I don't know. I had embarrassing moments all the time, such as um, Tuesday when I said that I would have demoted Ryan Weathers <laughs> because his strikeout rate was low and there was just no way what he was doing in these first few starts was sustainable. He comes out and just shoves against the Giants and the Marlins have had a handful of really good pitching performances from their starting rotation so far. You wouldn't think that's the case given their record to this point, but six innings, two earned, 10 Ks, one walk, five hits, and a W. And notice Brian Weathers has positive run value, it's still very early, on three of his pitches this season. Changeup, sweeper, and four-seamer. 
Looks like he's getting more movement on his changeup and his two seamer. So I know he's a guy you didn't like when he first broke in with the Padres. The mix back then wasn't very good. It was really, really just a two pitch approach as well. Does this version of Weathers, even if you don't think it's great, is it much more sustainable? Is it more reasonable to try and continue using him as a starter? This is a guy that once upon a time was a top 10 overall pick. So there's there's pedigree here, and he's not that old either. So I'm, I'm beginning to wonder if the old version of Ryan Weathers clouded my judgment just a little bit when I wanted to give him the quick demotion to AAA. Yeah, one thing that Weathers is doing that's a little bit worrisome is he's pitching really close to his maximum. His max is 98, and his sitting is 96.6. Hmm. Um, uh, maybe it's 98.8, but that's still under three, well under three. That's one of the league leaders in uh, how close he's sitting to his max. And I think he, in a microcosm, is part of this discussion where we, you know, how can you tell Ryan Weathers not to throw as hard as he can? Like he is obviously on the cusp of either going to the bullpen or being one of these up and down guys that gets traded around, right? Like he he's fighting for his life out there. Um, and so, I, you know, I'm not going to tell him not to throw hard. One uh, interesting thing is that the four seam fastball actually now has interesting IVB. It's uh, in terms of its vertical break, it's. Uh, around average and given his arm slot um, that's a really surprising development it's come it, it's added 13 inches of ride since he broke into the league um, and it's been a steady steady improvement so now he does have two workable fastballs um, in, in that uh, in that new four seam which um, is considered his best fastball but um, I think his sinker is one he's more comfortable with. Um, you know, sinker slider, four seam change. It looks workable. Here's another thing that happens when you throw as hard as you can and you're that close to your max. 92 location plus. Mm. What was his location plus previously? Uh, you know, how much did he actually lose? Uh, you know, it is a little bit early to be quoting that um, because it usually takes like 300, 400 pitches. Um, before you get there, but um, I am stalling. He, last year, 94, and uh, 2002, he, was he a, a, a Padre in 2002? Yes. And he's a Padre in 2002, so uh, 86. So maybe not great natural command. Yeah, um, I guess that's where some of the other reliever risk comes from in the long run, even though the, the needs, I think, are going to keep him in the rotation unless he completely collapses. You saw uh, walk rates. Like, when he was younger and he got his prospect grades, he had a 50 command grade from Fangraphs. But in the younger uh, stages, he had good walk rates. And then you saw, as he got closer and closer to the bigs, uh, his his walk rate went up, which is a function of confidence. You know, he, he was starting to get you know, having poor results. And so maybe you start to nibble and then uh, maybe he just started throwing close to his max as well. So I don't believe what he's doing right now, um, you know, is going is really sustainable. Um, but I do believe that he's made his case to uh, stay in the rotation as long as they need him. Um, I think he's moved ahead of puck. They still shouldn't have demoted Max Meyer, even if I was wrong about the guy they were going to send down. But play. Braxton Garrett's getting some, has had some bad news. He has uh, some dead arm uh, in mm. trying to come back. And so um, I think they need him. And so he's in the rotation for the time being. Um, I haven't, I haven't put him in a very flattering spot right now because our projection is for a 4.55 ERA. Uh, but I am going to move his projected innings uh, up to more like uh, 95 uh, or 110 even hmm. uh, because I think he's going to stick around a little bit. We've wondered for a few years if we had to eat a hat, how would we do it? I think our consensus <laughs> answer is battered and deep fried. I think that's the proper way to eat crow if you have to eat crow. Batter it, deep fry it, and hope for the best. A couple other injuries to get to here. You Darvish placed on the IL with neck tightness. And 
I immediately thought maybe Johnny Brito will get some starts. And then I looked at the game log and I thought to myself, maybe Johnny Brito won't be getting any starts. He's thrown 28 <laughs> or fewer pitches in every outing so far this year. They're using a much more like a short reliever um, yeah. than like someone who's going to be stretched out. Now, obviously, they could they could send them down. There's a, there's a plenty of ways to make it happen, but Brito is 26, so maybe they see the window for somebody else. Is there someone else you'd be eyeing up among the depth options in San Diego to possibly step in for a few turns while Darvish is on the shelf? I was just on the radio in San Diego today, and we were talking about this. And, you know, Adrian Morahan uh, is up with the big leagues, and some people have said that, you know, he he should be a starter. Um the corresponding move, uh, which deserves a jingle, uh, maybe some sort of slightly sad, uh, uninteresting jingle. <laughs> mm. What's the corresponding move? Um, the corresponding move was for a reliever. Um, and I'm thinking that this U Darvish thing does not sound super serious in my with my Dr. Nick hat on. Um, and so uh, I'm thinking, uh, if they're, they're going to try and skip it. And if there isn't, it's going to be a Morahan Brito, uh, led, uh, bullpen day. That's the back end of their bullpen. The guys that they could use at the beginning of a game and try to try to fake it as they make it. They did make that Darvish move retroactive to Monday. So he's eligible to return on the 30th of April. I think the thing you want to keep in mind this time of year, especially, because teams are not completely taxed just yet, they can do unusual things. You may have seen the Brewers basically use a bullpen game against the Padres on Wednesday, and they live to tell the tale. They won a game one nothing. that you know, Bryce Wilson chewed up a bunch of innings for them as a spot starter. They've used eight starters already, by the way. So yeah, wow. maybe it's a, a combo like that. And Morihan is really interesting. He throws hard. I, mm-hmm. I like him a lot as an el- possibly elite short reliever. Given some of the health issues he's had over the course of his career, that might be the best way to get something out of him. But he's one of those guys. You look at the results he's had so far in the big leagues overall, ERA over five, a whip close to 1.5. Those numbers are coming down. He's yeah. he's going to get it. He's going to unlock it. I think so. I think he'll be the setup guy uh, before long, or at least uh, because he's a lefty, uh, you know, kind of maybe uh, one of the seventh inning guys. I don't know if you, you want to go lefty, lefty, eighth and ninth, but... Um, you know, uh, it's Suarez is wait, is Suarez a righty? Robert oh, Suarez? Yeah, he's a righty. Why do I have Suarez as a lefty in my head? Um, I don't know. Are you thinking of like I've seen him pitch a bunch of times? Are you so thinking strange? Uh, why, why would that be backwards? Were you watching him in a reflection? Like, what? <laughs> I have no idea. I get confused. Anyway, uh, yeah, Morahan Suarez. I think that could happen. And and I think uh, it's good enough stuff that you could say, hey, can we get three innings out of Brito and Morahan? Yeah. You know, and could we keep it to, to one run or two runs? Yeah. So, you know, I think that'll be the deal. All right. For now, no clear pickup in San Diego as they look for a little if bit. If it had been Vasquez, help. you know, I would have thought, Oh, maybe this U Darvish thing is a little bit worse. One thing that I did notice while ranking U Darvish, though, is that his stuff has fallen off. Um, you know, the fastballs now are distinctly the kinds of fastballs that you'd want to hide. Um, you know, he's always been a cutter guy, but even the cutter right now is 82 stuff plus, and that's ranking it. This is really interesting. We we put cutters in with fastballs um, in this last model update, and you know, that's not going to be right for everybody. Some people use their cutters more as a breaking ball, but it was more right for more people and it helped the model be more predictive. And in you Darvish's case, the cutter is absolutely his fastball. So that going down to 82 stuff plus, I think is actually more reflective of what he, what he does. So looking at that, looking at his projections, um, he was one of the, uh, one of the people that lost the most in my rankings, actually. I understand it, but I also think he has enough ways to adjust where I have a little more confidence in Darvish figuring it out than I do in the typical pitcher going through something similar. I kept him right in the back end of the top 50. Does that feel fully off? I mean, he's hurt, you know? Yeah, I, I back in the top 50 for now can bounce back into the back of the top 30 
pretty yeah. quickly if he's good for a four or five start stretch. I, think I mean, you know, he's always good again. for the strikeouts, right? It seems. But, you know, 11.9% swing K minus BB is also not good. So there's there's a couple of red flags here. The team looks pretty good overall, like better than people thought in the winter. I do think the health of their rotation, Musgrove and Darvish, are really important to them. So finding a way to get them both right would go a really long way. Uh, staying in the NL West for a moment, Chris Bryant on the IL with a lower back strain. He's only played 13 games so far this year. When we've seen him, the K rate's been through the roof, 32.7%. He has not been Chris Bryant each of the last two seasons now in Colorado. Year one there was only 42 games on a per-game basis. It looked really good, and that got me kind of excited about what might happen this year with a clean bill of health entering the season. Is this just another bump in the road for a guy that will come back and produce, or are you beginning to have some major long-term concerns with Bryant, given that this is a back injury, he's had some pretty major shoulder stuff in the past, and he's 32 now, so physically coming back from this kind of stuff is a little bit harder. He hasn't hit a ball 110 since he signed with Colorado. Um, mm. That's something he did regularly before. And, you know, there was a nice, interesting tweet by Alex Chamberlain that I retweeted a, a couple of days ago that was just the effect of, of having a, a larger max EV is that it, it really demonstrates raw power. So it pushes. So if you have a 112 max EV, you could expect to have X percentage uh, of balls over 100, right? And uh, if you have a 105 at max EV, you, you'd have X minus, right? Uh, you just sort of, you can imagine that, right? I can imagine just the percentiles, you know? Um, and uh, and so he's, his raw power is gone. It's gone. He's no longer a guy that I would expect to have a league average uh, slugging percentage. Hmm. And his foot speed is gone. He's not making contact like he used to. He's not even showing the same discipline that he used to. I have nothing to hold on to. I have nothing to point you to. The only thing that I would say is that it's possible that this is all a, a tragedy that has something to do with altitude because people rest and recover worse at altitude. And these injuries are not necessarily something that was part of his game before. You know, he had kind of, you know, a, a 2018 season where he missed, you know, 150 plate appearances or so. But otherwise, he was largely healthy before he signed this deal. And then he has just fallen apart. I wonder, I mean, there's a lot of time left on that contract. He signed through 2028. I wonder if we're going to get something similar to what we saw with Nolan Arenado, where the Rockies eat a lot of money and Chris Bryant gets a chance to play some of those years out elsewhere like that. That'd be the only way to do anything with that deal and actually get something back in the organization is to just pay most of it down yourself. I mean, I think almost all of it. We've well, seen the recent trends in money movement. Uh, you have to think of Eric Hosmer. They they were trying to move Eric Hosmer for like four years, and then they finally moved him with one year and like $15 million on it. That's what's movable. Yeah. $15 million is movable. <laughs> yeah, not uh, not uh, nine figures like we're yeah. talking twenty six million for the AAV with five full years after this season still on it. So that's one hundred and four million for the last four years plus whatever you'd get this year. It's not going to happen this year. It this can't is, happen this year. No, because they'd it, have to they'd have to trade out. They have to pay out eighty ninety million. Mm -mm. That's that's not going to happen. It's a bummer because I I thought I thought Brian actually had the sort of foundation where he would age particularly well as long as he stayed healthy he cut the k's down from the very beginning of his career good eye at the plate uh, but that cumulative wear and tear of some significant injuries seems to have chipped away at the power in a way where it might not ever come all there the way was back. something there was something weird to me about his tenure in san francisco that was a red flag to me was mm -hmm. that san francisco traded him and then saw him for like a month and then did not even engage him in talks for free agency but there was clearly a need to possibly retain him. Yeah, the numbers weren't bad during that partial season in San Francisco. But there was something they saw when they got close up. I mean, I think that they tried him in center and they they thought he was a more defense. Maybe there was there was a time when we, he was thought to be very defensively versatile. Mm. And I, I would guess that the the thing that you see when you play somebody close up like that 
the thing that you can see the best on a day to day basis as a coaching staff is probably defense, and maybe maybe some work ethic stuff. I'm not I'm not trying to cast aspersions. I don't know his work ethic. I'm just saying those are the two things that you could see in a month of having him on your roster. What his what his style of preparation is, and maybe you know a little bit of defensive stuff. I would love to know when the Rockies win a free agent. I assume even for a hitter, given the state of their organization, how tough it is to win there, they usually have to overpay by some percentage, 10, 15% mm -hmm. compared to the next highest offer. Which is Who's weird the, for hitters, even. Why that should because like, well, like why would you go there if if you've already I mean Brian already won a World Series. So I guess if if that was the main thing you wanted to accomplish in your career and you already ticked that box, then it's like we'll get the best possible offer. It's Living kind of like the first nice. Eric Hosmer deal in San Diego, right? Which is like they paid the tax of he's the first San, the first free agents to sign there. But I wonder who had the silver medal offer in the Chris Bryant free agent sweepstakes, and I bet it was a hundred million dollars less. <laughs> you think it was that much less? It was seven for one eighty two is what he got. You think it was like four for eighty? Three yeah. for eighty. <laughs> That'd be the same AAV. Would be three for eighty. I think it would be like four, four for eighty, four for four wow. for a hundred, maybe. I, I think, I think the second offer had to be a little closer than that, but fun to think about at least. Hopefully, he gets healthy. Would love to see him produce again. Couldn't um, it be I, great to like get somebody to really tell you the truth? Yeah, I'd, I would love to get people to tell me the truth. Like nine out of ten times, I can't get that. And I would love to have that. <laughs> just to let, some, uh, let someone all the way in. Just what really happened? The truth yeah. serum for the agents. <laughs> Look, that's what we've wanted. We want, we want to give the agents the truth pay. serum. You pay. Tell us the whole truth. <laughs> well, I mean, when, when the text messages are, are in the... I know we it was funny. We made jokes that we would never like see it written on paper. I did the crime, but then right. like, those, some of those text messages were like, "I did the crime." Literally, we're like, "Hmm, okay." Technically, I did steal hard, from. Them. Hard oh. to argue with that. Okay, well, I guess that's that. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you do get the truth. It's just not the way you expect to get the truth. Yeah, right. <laughs> Moving on. So you wrote this week about some players uh, trying to find power who have a, a contact first skill set there were three featured in the article and we don't necessarily dig deep on all three because people could just read the story cj abrams jackson merrill stephen kwan that's the reverse order they were featured in the story but that's the order in which i believe in them having power yeah. that they're going to tap into like <laughs> kwan i will be forever skeptical of stephen kwan hitting for power you, you pointed to Luis Arias in the story as someone that we thought could add power at various points earlier in his career that ship has sailed. I think Stephen Kwan is more like a Luis Arias. But yeah. CJ Abrams, I think from a physical perspective, like I, I've had this and I feel I feel like an idiot because I waffled about CJ Abrams as a third rounder when Not, draft season started. I mean, yes, but 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 long, long story, like long form, you you have been the voice of reason on this podcast about CJ Abrams. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I've been the one who was pointing at his barrel rate too prematurely. Well, okay. So the reason I was kind of like, I don't know about him in the third round that I kind of warmed up to it was like thinking about physical projection and how young he was when he made it through the minors and all that lost time. We've talked about that every time Abrams has come up for the last two years. His, his minor league track record was shortened by a major injury and a pandemic. Mm -hmm. Nothing you can do about that. That's just lost time. And he still moved up to the big leagues quickly anyways. And I think five homers already in these first 15 end games has us really excited about things falling into place. Some of them are just so majestic. Like they're not just enough. No. He took Kyle Harrison up like high and tight, lefty on lefty. Kyle Harrison's fastball is his best pitch. And he took that thing to triples alley in San Francisco in the cold. Yeah. Yeah. That's a tough place to hit a home run when it's warm. And he did it what, on a 50 degree day. They, yeah, he pulled his hands in and did it. And so, you know, I, I think there is a difference between Quan and Abrams and 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 Dominic, uh, one of our listeners, did did point out like one of these things is not the other. And, and I think you've done that, too, with Quan. Um, but, you know, there's there's degrees of these things like you could have you could have uh, three or four Quans in in single A. 
and and one of them could turn into an Abrams type. You know what I mean? Uh, it's more that we've seen enough of Quan in the major leagues to be like, okay, the dude hasn't hit a ball 109 yet. You know, it's like right. the and so that's why I do think Max EV. People who have done like straight correlations between Max EV and other things have found that it's not the strongest and maybe it's not that useful. But I think it's really useful in the dynasty context, in in creating aging curves, and then for this particular thing, which is trying to decide if a guy has power that he can tap into in the future. And um, and so you know, Jackson Merrill uh, has already hit a ball 108.8. I think once you get over 108, I can see okay, if you're a, you you clear 108 and you have better than a 10% swing strike rate, uh, I like you. I like you a lot, and I think you might be able to uh, add power. That list right now, kids under 24, 24 and under maybe, kids under tw- uh, 24 and under with a swing strike rate of 10% or less and a max EV. I, I set the line at 107 here for this one because it it, it got more major leaguers. Um, and then 30 plate appearance. I, actually, I don't even know if I had to do with a plate appearance metric. This this is just all the players uh, under 24 and under that have a swing strike rate under 10, 10% and under and a max EV over the 107. These are all interesting players. There's a player you may never have heard of before named Wyatt Langford on here. Corbin Carroll. Oh, that's, that's a good player. Uh, CJ Abrams is on here. Gabriel Moreno. You suggested another catcher. Yeah. Two. Uh, I, I got two that I think are, are worth considering. Kibit Ruiz and Luis Campusano. Oh, yes. Campusano just needs like an inch of play discipline. Not even a yard, just an inch. Um, uh, Jackson Merrill's on this list. Mason Wynn is on this list. Johan Rojas, Michael Garcia, uh, Colt Keith, Anthony Volpe, and Ivan Herrera making it four catchers. Yeah. So... Uh, I think this is a good list. And I know Michael Garcia's, you know, hadn't come out to the best start. Uh, Anthony Volpe is is sort of newly on this list <laughs> because of the swing changes he made to accent uh, his contact ability over his power. Uh, so he's not, he's kind of in going the other direction, a guy that decided to make more contact. But in any case, this is a really good collection of players. And it sort of suggests to me I've been trying to shop Mason Wynn and my 12 team keeper. Psh, maybe I'll just keep him, you know, uh, if nobody's going to take him. It says, be patient with Colt Keith's beginning of the season. It says, maybe believe in Yvonne Herrera, you know? So I, I think this is a good list of, of players. I'm going to put the list in the weekly recap because I didn't get it. <laughs> I have major photoshop problems that i don't know how to fix <laughs> that i couldn't fix before the show so it's a good use of the recap anyway so i'm going to put the table and if you're like where's the table it's going to be in the recap you'll see it you'll see the table the thing about why Cole didn't Keith, ruiz make it uh age right you said under 24 oh, yeah. 25 yeah mm-hmm. or 25 so yeah he, he also has- hasn't hit a ball this is also having hit a ball this year but he's hit a ball 110 before yeah and we've had i think for probably I would say most of the life of this podcast, we've had an open question as to whether Ruiz would get to more consistent power because he showed occasional flashes of it and his samples at some levels were partial seasons. And you'd see it and you say, well, it was only 38 games and it was high A, but he was young for the level and he did it. And then you'd see the ground ball rate tick up a little bit as he advanced. You think, oh, okay, maybe the approach isn't quite right, but the hit tool has always been there. It is more of the aggressive sort of approach, right? It's a 38.5% O swing percentage for his career. So that's something that he's, he swings a lot, but that's just something he does. Camposano fits into that bucket as well. I would also say that when you look at a list like this and you see some catchers pop, we know catchers can take a little bit longer to unlock all of their offensive and ability. Their stealing is usually limited by playing time. Right. Uh, in the case of Ruiz, I think it's, Hey, we'll just keep throwing you out there because you're our guy. <laughs> I think you're you're looking at a run for Ruiz for these next few seasons where you know, 500 plate appearances is the norm uh, for the next two to three and seasons. If you, can, if you can acquire him through this this weird IL illness, you know, 
sort of crappy start to the season. If you can use that to acquire him in a keeper league, I would. If you're holding on to him in a redraft and you're wondering why, I, I would I would try to hold as long as you can. I know maybe you have three or four injured pitchers right now next to him. And you need to you need to move on. I get it. Then maybe you have to do that. But if you can hold on to him, I would. Yeah. It's a good interesting group of names here. Hitting more fly balls this year, are ways. It's the lowest ground ball rate of his career. It's a it's too early to say that's a real thing, but I would say that ground ball rate is one of those things that's like on the month, like in a month you can know that there's something there. Um, so there's something something going on with him that's that's good. And and then I think Jackson Merrill, you know, I think he's going to maybe hit 18 to 22 homers, not necessarily this year. But soon, it does look more like a 2020 skill set with a good average, which is a mm-hmm. really good fantasy player because that usually bumps you up to a high position in the batting order. So you're going to score a boatload of runs, or you're at least a good enough run producer where you're going to do both of those things. I wonder. I wonder if because Jackson Merrill, like he had plenty of prospect hype anyway, but he moved so fast through the minors. If sometimes that keeps us from fully realizing a player's ceiling not necessarily people who are focused on prospects all the time but more of a redraft situation like it's it's the inverse of the fatigue he wasn't on the list for six five or six years he cruised up so fast he didn't graduate and sit in the top five on the list for a while before coming up he jumped up when he was in the 20 range on a lot of they didn't have time to sort of you know accumulate that like jackson holiday uh uh uh, hype Hmm. but you know, uh, his last overall rating on uh, on Fangrass was eight. <laughs> like this is yeah, somebody so he's getting there. Somebody that we should that we should be. You know, if we had been like sort of if we'd been if like if he wasn't up right now, he would be getting some of that hype, right? Right. When's Jackson Merrill coming up? You know, when's the next Jackson coming up? <laughs> That's how it would go. Prospect fatigue happens, and sometimes like just really weird slow starts to a career happen. So kind of kicking off Project Prospect for the week, looking at Jack Leiter. He's debuting for the Rangers against the Tigers today. Stuff looked a lot different at Triple H just in terms of everything. The K's went through the roof. The walks were down. More swinging strikes than we've seen at any point during his time in the Rangers organization. Was he popping in the model in these first few turns at Triple A as well? Because... It looked like Jack Leiter was stuck coming out of 2023. The Ks were there, but the control wasn't. And for a team that desperately needed help in the first half of this season with a lot of pitchers down, people would have thought, yeah, Jack Leiter could be an answer prior to what he'd done in their system. Like when he was drafted, the timetable would have been before now for him to arrive. Yeah. So what do you make of Leiter and the struggles he's gone through and maybe some of the adjustments he's made to, to get this opportunity? I mean, there was there were some some major adjustments that he tried uh, uh, pitching more north south instead of east west and this and that. And there was a lot of different things he was going through. And I, I just get the feeling from the outside. So this is not super sourced, but I, I, I've actually seen, you know, some bullpen sessions like when we were in the backfields and I've seen kind of how many people are standing around. And so I'm kind of connecting the dots here and being like famous dad, you know, like probably has his own people. So a little bit of maybe some too, co- too many cooks in the pot, or at least there was a lot going on around Jack Leiter in terms of what he was supposed to do and when he was supposed to do it and how, how he was supposed to get better, you know? Um, and so what I've, you know, more sourced, I've heard that uh, Jordan Teagues, the pitching coordinator, um, you know, had a lot to do with this last round of attempts, which was to get him to really work more linear to the plate uh, and hold his front side closed a touch longer uh, and with a little bit shorter of a stride. So these are some mechanical fixes as much as anything. And then uh, Lance Brozdowski pointed out that where he's trying to throw, he's changed a little bit too. He's, um, kind of established Lone Away as a, a place that he can hit. Now, that's kind of funny because Lone Away has gone out of style. And, you know, you kind of want guys who can command it high. That's the that's the new league. Uh, but I would say with Jack Ladder, you'd be like, yo, I'll take wherever you can put it regularly. 
you know, <laughs> like, yeah. let's let's go with that because he had uh, buy stuff plus the fourth best stuff plus in the minors, which is um, not everybody in the minors. You know, it's triple uh, A, most of triple A and some of single A. <laughs> so it's not like I can say best fourth best stuff plus in all the minors. But among the uh, among the stats that we had, definitely uh, an exciting debut today. Yeah, so we'll see what the numbers look like coming out of the start against the Tigers. But I can see lighter popping at least for 15-team leagues because of the high K potential, maybe even getting on some rosters in 12s, given what they need right now in Texas. Uh, the Dodgers brought up a couple of prospects this week. Andy Pagues is one of them. Going to get some run in the outfield and against hitter, against pitchers both from uh, the left side and the right side. So it's not, not a case where he's going to be a small side platoon guy, which is the way you'd like to see an outfielder debut. They've had a hard time getting production from their outfield early on this season. I'm sure a lot of that will correct itself over time. Um, Pagues missed a lot of time last year because of a major shoulder injury. So to see him bounce back from that, kind of hit the ground running at AAA and get this early opportunity, uh, it's just nice to see from like a player development standpoint. I guess this I is feel like rarely this. We've solution. been waiting on him forever. <laughs> well, we talked about him as a, I think, a prospect of the week. Once in like upon a 2021. time, twenty twenty one. Yeah, because he in twenty twenty one, he I mean unlocked thirty one homers. Season, yeah, yeah, brought the K rate down, walked more, and was still really young for the level. And I mean, look, he's been he's been pretty good like everywhere he's played. Uh, his first taste of Double A, he was just league average as a twenty one year old. But you can't hold that against a player. So there's power, there's some speed, there's a pretty good eye at the plate. I think there's a chance he actually plays well enough to keep a spot because. Once Jason Hayward comes back, I think you could look at Hayward as someone that plays a bit less over time. You start looking at the way they could group guys. I mean, if, if they're not happy with James Outman, Paez could play there. I think defense is the one thing that could keep Outman's bat in the lineup, even when he's not hitting, is that he's a good defensive center fielder. But how do you see things fitting? I mean, the only thing that really makes it extra crowded is Shohei Otani being there as a DH because... Teoscar Hernandez yeah, has to play in the outfield. Put, yeah, you can't put Teoscar there. You got one fewer spot to rotate through, but I think it's just weak enough where I'm intrigued about the possibility of him sticking. I mean, there's some daylight there. The weird, I mean, he he played seven innings in center field too. Mm-hmm. Um, so it seems like they they think enough of his his defense out there. And then you know one of the things that speaks so well about him being. <clears throat> ready is that he he cut his strikeout rate to the best he's ever had in the minor leagues down to 17 percent and that's really where outman's had the the, the trouble um <clears throat> this year uh, outman has hit the ball about as hard as he has in the past um he's striking out just as much as he's had in the past and he's just not getting the luck on balls and play that he had in the past and that's what happens like if you hit, if you strike out 32 33 percent of the time you might hit 210 and that's where Altman finds himself right now so um i do think that is the daylight is that, you know if pa has says you know and he has he struck out a little bit too much so far but you know seven plate appearances if he can get in there and um and uh and play defense well enough he could take it i don't think he's got the same defensive chops as Altman, and he's a right hander so uh you know i don't I, I I wouldn't necessarily say he's the favorite. It could still be a short-term thing. He's not the favorite, but I think they're about ready to move on from Chris Taylor. I think when you look at Chris Taylor's start, 18 Ks in 42 plate appearances to start the season. It, it's been a, a multi-year kind of slide from the player Taylor was in the first five or so years he was in the organization. Maybe it's not full on DFA, but I think it's reduced expectations, really using him as purely a small side platoon guy as opposed to an everyday guy when someone's hurt. That this would have been a Taylor opportunity in the past. So I think you know, Pi is getting this chance tells us something. Uh, what do you make of the other guy the Dodgers brought up, Landon Knack? I think he came up sort of in passing uh, last week. And I also think uh, at the time I mentioned River Ryan as a guy who was on the 60-day IL. He's not on the 60-day IL because he's not on the 40-man. He's just on the minor league IL. Mm. So keep that in mind if you're trying to stash him somewhere. But Landon Knack is another pretty good prospect in his own right. And I think when you're the 5th, 6th, 7th best prospect in the Dodgers system, you can get a little bit overshadowed. But 
you might be the second, third, or fourth best prospect in a different organization. Uh, what does Knack bring to the table, and, and how do you see him you know, working against big league hitters initially? I Better fastball than Gavin Stone, better slider than Gavin Stone. Uh, uh, you know, right there with, with Michael Grove on the slider, but a better fastball than Michael Grove. Um, so... You know, personally, uh, and, and like uh, I think ahead of Kyle Hurt, who came out and pitched in in you know a, a two inning stint instead of a five inning stint. So I have him ahead of Stone, Grove, and Hurt. Um, Emmett Sheehan is shut down indefinitely. So that, that's the real sixty day IL pitcher for the Dodgers, right? So like what like what are you left looking at here? Is like maybe. He's got some runway. What was the corresponding move for this one? Uh, Bobby Miller? Yeah, I think I think Knack replaced Bobby Miller when Miller hit the IL with that shoulder. Okay, injury. so when Bobby Miller comes back, you got Yamamoto, Glasnow, Bueller, Paxton, and Miller. So you got five. So I guess what I'm saying is Knack is the six. Um, but I would also say James Paxton is not looking that great out there. Uh, you know, he has more walks than strikeouts. The velo is down. Just uh, the swing strike rate is down. Uh, the stuff is down. I mean, uh, James Paxton right now could lose his job to 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 uh, to uh, Landon Knack. And, and I think that one's more wide open even than what Andy Paz has in front of him. Yeah, just because of all of the injuries that have been piling up on the Dodgers, it was a nice debut for Knack. Five innings through 75 pitches, two earned, four hits, four Ks, one walk. It was a nice home matchup against the Nationals. I, I think you'd generally want to be matchup dependent with him initially, but room for growth for sure and maybe a longer opportunity than expected. One more prospect to get to as a result of the Dominic Canzone injury. Jonathan Classe getting a chance in Seattle, debuting a little sooner than expected. There's been some prospect fanfare around Classe for a little while. Uh, he's a switch hitter. Uh, how do you see him kind of fitting in? He's just 21, so debuting a little sooner than expected. You know, you think about some of the the contact issues he's shown as high as Double A. That's sort of the what could go wrong, but the what could go right. This is a guy that had double digit homers and 61 stolen bases last year at the double A level in just 108 games. He's fast. He's fast. fast. And and I think one of the things that uh that's cool about him too is that you know I've I've had him on teams and dropped him. And you know, he's kind of the one of those stories of like, you know, you the 18 year old that pops. Uh, in a ball and you get all excited about him and then you drop him because he takes a step back and the kind of winding road it can take. I mean, in a ball uh, as a really young guy, uh, he had 55 steals and, you know, like, Oh, let's put him on the roster. Uh, and then he comes back in double a and has a 94 WRC plus uh, still young though. You know, and maybe I dropped him too prematurely uh, because, you know, 94, at that, at his age in Double A, should get a, a boost of at least what we found for that piece, like twenty points of WRC plus. So now, if you look at this guy and say, "Oh, he's a one fourteen and one nineteen WRC plus in in Double A with sixty two steals," uh, yeah, he should have been featured on our on our uh, on our podcast more often. I don't know if the transition will be super easy and if he'll be there forever because he is a little bit more. In terms of tools, like speed is his best tool. Uh, contact is not one of his best. Uh, power kind of comes and goes. And so a player like that, I could see him striking out too much at first uh, and maybe needing a couple attempts at the big leagues. But again, if he doesn't do that well at first, don't write him off. You know, maybe when he's 22 and he comes back, that's the time to really buy in on classic. Is... Is it fair to even throw Class A's name out there in the Victor Scott bucket in terms of prospect expectations? I think Scott would have popped on more lists than Class A. I mean, if you look at the Rotowire page for Class A, is really interesting because James Anderson's rankings are charted over time, and it's been a roller coaster. The, the Jonathan Class A rankings roller coaster would be a fun roller coaster ride, um, unless you you know had him the entire time. But I, I'd look at this kind of profile, and I think it's 
it's a little bit Victor Scott esque for me. I don't know if you get the the same sort of defensive value. Like like Victor Scott's going to be a good defensive center fielder. I don't think there's any mm-hmm. question about that. I'm not sure I could say that about Class A with the same confidence. I mean, you see it in the fielding grade, 45 present, future 50. But you also as far see as fantasy it, value, I think they're kind of close. You also see it. Uh, oh, I was I was looking at Dominic Canzone. That was that was confusing. I was like, man, he's played a lot of left field. <laughs> uh, there there has been some left field uh, for for Class A in the minors. So um, that's a little bit. That's a little bit of a like. Oh, that's interesting. Why did they even do that? You know, maybe it was for defensive versatility when he gets to the big leagues, I guess. But um, if you were just like a set it, forget it, left uh, center fielder, like I would like to see how much Victor Scott played off of center field in the minor leagues. Probably never or very yeah, rarely. I exactly. I don't think I don't I don't see anything on fan graph. So, um, yeah. So I, I, I think um, I think he's a little bit behind in terms of defense. I'm not sure that defense will uh will keep him on the field uh you know if his bat isn't quite there partially also because of the different context of the teams the mariners need offense Mm -hmm. you know and so if he's not going to necessarily pride provide offense then i think when canzone is healthy class a might go back let's shift the focus quickly to the waiver preview we're gonna do this in like five minutes today we'll spend more time on it most weeks I got to go to the airport. <laughs> he was literally going to go to the airport. So the player I wanted to throw at you was Elbert Suarez. He's back up for the Orioles. He had a really good start in the spring against the Phillies that got my attention. Didn't start the season on the roster, but five and two thirds scoreless, four Ks, no walks, three hits. I think it kind of works. They've got a lot of injuries right now. Kyle Bradish's rehab assignment so far is going well, but Tyler Wells recently went on the IL. John Means is still down. So there could be at least a few more turns here for Suarez. What's your interest level on him? He's a bit unusual because he spent so much time away from you know, professional ball here in North America, but he was in the KBO for a little while and just looks like he's got better stuff than he had when he left. Yeah, he wasn't performing that well in AAA, though, and um, it's a, the, that's, one, that's on the negative side for me. The stuff plus is not amazing on him. He's a really fastball-heavy guy, so it's, that's a little bit weird. On the, on the positive side, I guess, quote-unquote positive, he has no options. So now that they made this move, he has to be on the big league squad. And so I wonder, you know, maybe he'll transition to being a long man in the bullpen. Keegan Aiken used to be that long man in the bullpen. Um, and uh, now he's he's more of a short man. Uh, I, I, I don't mean he's short anyway. Um, <laughs> so I think Suarez could be the long man. I, I've still heard uh, that Armbruster is, is, is next. Uh, Kate Povich is the guy that everyone's excited about. Uh, and John Means is only allowed to have like two or three more starts in the minor leagues before he has to be brought up. Mm. Uh, he, they're kind of extending his rehab. So um, I think that this is a week to week thing for Suarez. If you like his matchups next year, then you like next week, then you like him. All right. So the open question as we go what are you thinking about on the wire this week? Is it someone like William Abreu who's getting an expanded role in Boston? Is it Yoel Piamps in leagues where he was dropped since he's now getting saves for the Brewers? And Abner Uribe pitched in the fourth inning earlier this week and then pitched in the eighth in the game that they won on Wednesday. It just seems like the, the plan in Milwaukee is definitely written in pencil right now. Yeah, there's a weird thing going on in Seattle too. Uh, the and Andres Munoz's stuff is down. And uh, he's pitching in the seventh. Um, and I don't really know what's going on there. Um, Ryan Stanek has like a 20% walk rate. And so um, there's an opening there uh, that Matt Brash might step into at some point as he comes back. Uh, so I don't know what's going on in Seattle. Piamp seems like the guy, but it might be short term. I mean, you know, every day gets a little bit closer to hearing that, you know, uh, Devin Williams is, pit- is throwing again or whatever it is. So um, I-, I don't like Piamp's stuff as much as Uribe, but maybe they like Uribe as the guy to get everyone out, in, like the, the middle of the order out in the seventh, you know, um, and Piamp's just to, to shut things down. Piamp's is a little bit less. Um, shaky in terms of command. Abner can kind of, the command can come and go. If there's a long-term, if Williams doesn't come back and there's a long-term bet here, it's still Abner Uribe for me. 
I wonder if Trevor McGill, once he comes back from the concussion IL, if he starts getting saves again. He's had a couple of scoreless appearances at Nashville after suffering a concussion. He he fell, which was really odd. He fell like going. He went to the mall and was getting a new router or something, and just yeah, he just collapsed from food poisoning, which is scary. But say, uh, the whole thing is crazy. I've I've fainted a couple of times, so I feel badly for him. But um, yeah, that's a that's a big deal. I'm also ready to drop Jesus Sanchez. Mm. Uh, in 15 teams, I'm just looking at it. I think Scott, it, it, it can be a drop, drop, drop because um, what you're getting to is uh, people getting healthy. Lars Newbar is playing in center, and uh, and then Dylan Carlson's going to get healthy at some point. And I think that they'll just uh, they'll send Victor Scott back down. I don't think I think I still like I think this is one of those like whoa big leagues moments for Victor Scott. I don't think that that means that he's not good. Um, I, I, I think he just needed to get shocked. He's going to go back and work and work his way back up. Um, and, uh, there'll be another opportunity for him. Yeah. I, I think it's a, still a good long-term player to target, but short-term interest has fallen to the point where I would agree with you. I think Victor Scott is a drop. Uh, we're going to go. Eno's headed to the airport on our way out the door. A reminder, Closing the computer and going to the airport. <laughs> Theathletic.com slash rates and barrels gets you a subscription. Find Eno on Twitter at Eno Saris. Find me at Derek Van Riper. Find the pod at rates and barrels. Join the Discord. The link is in the show description. Be sure to hit the like button on this video. It's going to do it for this episode of Rates and Barrels. We're back with you live at 1 o'clock Eastern on Friday. Thanks for listening.